remember the meetings then and pray for the Lord's Day morning that the Lord may draw graciously near. Me and Newcastle always insisted that we made two stipulations in coming to the table. That which you must be saved and the ladies must have their heads covered. I was uh, at a meeting one day, it was a women's meeting, and uh, the lady who ran the meeting, she was very well to do and all the other things. We had a cup of tea before the meeting started, and she was sitting beside me, and she said, uh, You're very hard on women in Newcastle without hats. I said, No, I'm not. Oh, she says, You are. Oh, no, I said, I'm not. The descriptor X. Oh, she says, I believe a woman's hairs are covering. Oh, I said, you read the magazine, weren't you? Who the what? I said, he didn't explain it very well. Can you hear that? If a man prays with his head covered, he dishonored his head. If a woman prays with her head uncovered, he dishonored her head. I said, it's exactly the same word in the Greek, you know. So if it's hair for the woman, it's hair for the man. And if it's hair, then if a man prays with his head covered, that's the hair on, which is a, this is a real up of a skin head. Because <laughs> I'm not far from it anyway. <laughs> you see, you've got to keep to the book, you know. That's what the book said. And she said, well, I never saw it that way before. I said, I knew that, dear, because you didn't want to see it. And that's what's wrong. So we'll be here on Lord's Day morning. I should have been in another place, but I took off for the front of the wet you God willing, on Sunday. Uh, we need your prayers because on Saturday night I'm in Schenkel preaching. It's a big festival and I'm preaching there on Saturday night. I'll be here on Sunday. And then I'm back again in Schenkel at half past eight on Sunday night, preaching the word of God. And so we're busy working for the Lord, preaching the old fashioned gospel. A mom came yesterday to our house and he said, I want to talk to you. I said, Come on out. And we went down and he sat down. And I knew who he was. He was the warden's rector, or the rector's warden, that's what it was, the rector's warden from Kilkeel. Get mixed up with these early things. <laughs> Did you laugh and you still know I made a mistake? <laughs> you yourself. So, I want to talk to you. I said, what do you want? I want you to come and preach. I said, all right, I'll go and preach. I said, why do you ask? Said, yes, I'll go. Now, I'll be the first nonconformist that ever preached there. I was the first nonconformist to preach in the parish church in Anna Law. I went there to preach, and the rector took me into the best play, and he started putting rooms on. I don't know what. You want to see the money put off? What a whole lot off. It's just to be good, my people, put these off. And I said, you could ask me to put them on, my defense. No, I said, I wouldn't ask you. But he says, you know, you'll have to walk up in front of like my I said, I don't mind walking up. And he walked up all along Park and Neil on him and he was a suit on And I said, look, why I don't know what to do, mind you. She said, you sit down, when I get up, you get up, and when I get down, you get down. I go up and down like you, you. <laughs> and I could preach in the Word of God. The rector of Newcastle, our dear husband, he, he, he's a gentleman, mind you. Proper gentleman, for the Lord God. But as black and as dark as possible. And he was coming up on Sunday to the church, and I was going out and walk and stop. He said, uh, we're coming to the meeting, coming to church. I said, who's preaching? He said, it's me. He said, the fellow sitting in the car with him. He said, George, are you going? He said, I don't know. I said, George, you must be looking for punishment. That's what I'll tell him preaching. He said, will you preach for me next Sunday? Oh, well. What do you do? And he said, I said, oh, well, I'll give you 10 minutes. He said, I couldn't give a text. I'll give you 10 minutes. <laughs> Give me 15. I said, 15 minutes is going to be used for me. He said, I'll give you as long as you like. And I got in to preach the word of the Lord. And when I get saved and come out as a preacher, I promise God that I will go wherever I got the opportunity. But people said to me, Mr. Irvin, those of you have went there, you'll have to bring them to your church. Not a bit of me, I said, they'll never be in my church. Boys will never stand on the platform in our church. And you'll go there. I certainly will, but they're not coming here. And I went, and I'll go again, but they're not coming there. <laughs> um, so do pray that the Lord will richly bless God willing on the weekend as we go forth with the gospel message. Now, Nehemiah chapter 3, verse 28. From above the horse gate prepared the priests, everyone over against his house. 
And tonight we come to the horse gate, one of the gates of Jerusalem. You'll note that in the Word of God there are different animals used in the Scriptures for portraying to us certain great truths. In Job chapter 11 verse 12 it talks about for being man with the wise though he be born like a wild ass's coat. Uh, and here's an ass typifying man in his unregenerated state. He's like a wild ass's coat. Man in his unregenerated state. Uh, and in the book of Exodus chapter 13 verse 13 it says that. And every firstling of an ass thou shalt redeem with a lamb, and if thou shalt not redeem it, then thou shalt break his neck. And man like a wild ass's colt is not only born away from God, but he's born under the condemnation of God, and he needs to be redeemed. So unregenerated man is looked like as a wild ass's colt. Then there's the ox. We all know that the ox speaks of service. And all who are redeemed by the blood of Christ, the Lamb of God, should be like the ox, marked by service. In Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 10, it says, Thou shalt not plow with an ox and an ass together. And the reason for that was the ox was a clean animal, and the ass was unclean. So that in our service for the Lord, we're not to be unequally yoked. Our service for the Lord then has to be in accordance with the Word of God. And the work that God blesses is that which is done in keeping with His truth. So there's the ass which speaks of unregenerated man. And there's the ox that would speak of service. And our service has to be in keeping with the teaching of the Word of God. There's got to be no only for you, no only for you. Then there's the lamb. And of course the lamb speaks of sacrifice. And the lamb typifies our Lord Jesus Christ. You remember John on the banks of the Jordan cried, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. And if you go through the, the word of God, you will see how often the lamb is brought before us. And every time it's brought before us, there emerges a new truth. I'm going to do this very quick tonight. Your paper and pencil, take it down. First of all, in Genesis chapter 4, verse 4, you have Abel's lamb. And there you have a lamb for sin. A lamb for sin. In Genesis 22 and 8, you have Abraham's lamb. And there you have a lamb for a person, Isaac. Exodus 12, 21, you have the Passover lamb. And there you have a lamb for the family, all sheltered under the blood. In Leviticus 23, 18, you have the Levitical lamb. And there you've got a lamb for the nation, the whole nation. In Isaiah 53 and verse 7, you have the suffering lamb. There you've got a lamb for the elect. In John 1, 29, the lamb of God, and there you have a lamb for the world. In Exodus 32, you have the lamb led to the slaughter. There you have a lamb for the whosoever. In 1 Peter chapter 1, 19 to 21, you have the risen lamb. And there you have a lamb for the whole of Estra. Then in Revelation 5, 6, you have the lamb in the midst of the throne. There you have a lamb for the universe. And then in Revelation 22, 30, 22 and 3, you have the glory of the lamb. And there you have a lamb for all eternity. All eternity. No wonder we sing sometimes to worship the lamb, all glorious above. And may we make much of the Lamb of God, and may we not only serve him and give him our lives, but that we may worship him. And so you have the ass that speaks of unregenerated man. You have the ox that would speak of service and keeping with the word of God. 
you have the lamb speaking of sacrifice, and then you have the horse, and the horse in the word of God speaks of war. Now come away over to the book of Jude, chapter 39, verse 19. Hast thou given the horse strength? Hast thou closed his, closed his neck with thunder? Canst thou make him afraid as a grasshopper? The glory of his nostrils is terrible. He paweth in the valley and rejoices in his strength. He goeth out to meet the art man. He mocketh at fear and is not afraid. Neither turneth he back from the sword. Whoever handleth against him, glittering spear in the shield. He swalloweth the ground with the fierceness of his rage. Neither believeth he that it is the sound of the trumpet. He saith among the trumpets, Ha ha, ha ha. And he smelleth the battle afar off, thunder of the captains, and the shouting. So you see that the horse in the word of God speaks of war. In the book of Zechariah and in the book of the Revelation, we read of four symbolic horsemen. And these four horsemen speak to us of warrior power. When Christ, the eternal Son of God, descends from heaven to the great battle of the great God that precedes the great supper, he is seen in vision riding upon a white horse. Revelation 19.11 And I saw heaven open, and behold a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness doth he judge and make war. And the horse is used with striking frequency in the scriptures as the figure of the warrior. So that the horse gift tonight typifies soldier service in a world that's opposed to God and his truth. Writing in Jude in verse 3, we are bidden to contend earnestly for the truth. 1 Timothy 6.12 says, fight the good fight of faith. 1 Timothy 1.18, we're exhorted to war, a good warfare. And in 2 Timothy 4.7, the apostle said as he came to the end of life, I have fought a good fight. So you see that the horse gate would remind us of soldiers' service or warriors for the law in this world of fact. Now, if you come over to 2 Timothy chapter 2, You'll note certain things there. In verse 5, this child of God is looked at as an athlete. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully, all thinking of the race, for the crown at the end. And the child of God is looked at there as an athlete. In verse 6, he's looked at as a farmer. The husbandman or the farmer that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. But you'll note in verse 3 that he's looked at as a soldier. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Now, as an athlete, we are to run lawfully, keeping within the course that we may gain the prize, the crown corruptible cry. As a farmer, we're to labor anticipatively, looking forward to the harvest we're going to reap. And as a soldier, we're to fight vigorously. We're to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And as a soldier, we're to fight the battles of the Lord, and that we might fight well and be victorious there are two great imperatives here's the first you must know your enemy if you and I are going to fight vigorously and at the end of life journey receive the righteous crowd then we have got to know the enemy that we're fighting against that's the important fight in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 we have the enemy that we fight against as soldiers described for us. It says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, 
but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You see, our, the enemy that we have got to face is spiritual, of flesh and blood, but spiritual. The whole powers of darkness, the whole powers of hell against the child of God. And we have got to realize this, that our enemy is powerful, or our enemy is Satan, with the powers of darkness and his emissary. And child of God, remember this, you have got a very powerful enemy against you. And the moment you get seen, the whole power of Satan, the whole power of darkness is turned against you. That's the enemy. And remember this, Satan will not always attack you physically. Sometimes he does that with the people of God. They have suffered some of them down through the ages. We think of the Spanish Inquisition, of the Huguenots, of the Scottish Covenanters. Do you know that in Northern Ireland, that they came up from Armagh to Rich Hell, and they nailed Christians to the church doors? Sometimes he texts physically, and in parts of the world tonight he's still doing that against the people of God. But you know more than often he attacks us mentally, and he gets doubts infused into our minds, and he gets us to doubt God and the power of God, and to doubt the word of God, and he gains the victory over us. And there's one thing you've got to do is to get to know your enemy. And here's something. Don't underestimate your enemy. People do that. You know, when the archangel would test with the devil over the body of Moses, he knew that he was against a powerful foe, and he wouldn't bring a really accusation against him, which is the Lord of the faith. Don't you underestimate the power of Satan? I tell you, he's a powerful foe. You know, Great Britain almost lost, lost the last war because she underestimated the enemy. Why they told us that the panzer divisions of the Germans were made of plywood. They said the battle of the war would be over in six months time. They'll never break through the magical line. And the British troops left singing, we'll hang out our washing on the Siegfried line. They underestimated the enemy, and they were thrown out of Europe. I met a man, and we tried to get an and he just took off from the church. I said, Ernie, what was it like? He says, Jim, it was hell. He says, I landed in England with not a stitch on me. He said, I'll say this. I got down in the beaches and I prayed to God for to get me home. Underestimate the enemy. But here's something else you've got to do. Don't overestimate it. Because when Satan is powerful, he's not all powerful. There's God our God is. Jesus is stronger than Satan and sin. Satan to Jesus must die. Praise the Lord. Not that we are enemy. There's something else. You must be equipped for the fight. You must have the equipment. And in Ephesians chapter 6 verses 13 to 18, we have the armor that God has provided for us that we may fight against these powers, spiritual powers, and that we may overcome them. You know there are six pieces of armor. There's the girdle of truth. There's the breastplate of righteousness. There's the shoes of the gospel of peace. There's the shield of faith. There's the helmet of salvation. There's the sword of the spirit. There are five pieces for defense. There's one piece for offense, the sword of the Spirit. And the child of God hasn't always to be on the defense. We have got to carry the battle into enemy territory. We have got to use the sword of the Spirit to carry the battle into the enemy. Our Lord Jesus Christ said that, Thou art Peter. And the word he used there for Peter was a piece of rock. 
Thou art Peter, and upon this rock, and the word he used there was the essential rock, was in Peter, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And here's the way we all talk. Ah, oh, the gates of hell will come up against the church. That's not what Christ meant at all. You know, when, it, when an army is on the offensive, it doesn't carry the gates of a city with it. It's when it's on the defensive that it comes behind the gates. That's what Jesus said. He's saying to his church, Look, carry the battle right to the very gates of hell. The gates of hell shall not prevail again. And far too long we have been on the defensive instead of being on the offensive, carrying the battle right to the very gates of hell. And being conquerors. And we sit back singing, rescue the perish and care for the dying, and we do nothing about it. And you sit at the fire as the voice is to give corn beef legs for donkey, singing, rescue the perish and care for the dying. That's what Christ saying. We're to carry the battle right to the very gates. Didn't he do that? On the cross, there's a thief. The flames of hell were licking the soles of his feet. Jesus slashed him. Take it for one being part of that. But the church has got to them. We're soldiers of the Lord. We're warriors of the battle. We are not always to be on the defensive. All the trouble that the church today is, we're not invading new territory. Why we're not even holding what we have. And so we're to carry the battle for him. You look know that with all the armor that's mentioned in the Ephesians like there's nothing for the back. No armor for the back of the child of God. For the reason, you never have got to turn your back to the enemy. You always face it. Resist the devil. They'll flee from you. Somebody says resist the deacons and they'll flee at you. Great, they can't play at me now. So boy, I can pack some now, all right. But you see, you're never to turn your back on the enemy. Now, if you come over again to Second Timothy chapter 2, you'll see three things about the believer as a soldier. You note, first of all, in verse 4, the privilege he enjoys. It says, No man that war them tendeth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. See the privilege he enjoyed. He's chosen by the Lord to be a soldier. And because God has chosen us to be soldiers, then let us never surrender or compromise to or with the enemy. To surrender or compromise with the enemy will constitute you a traitor to him who has called you to be a soldier. It is a treason against the law. You see, the believer in Christ is called to salvation. We're called to holiness, and we're called to fight. That is to fight the battles of the law. And that we're going to be good soldiers of Jesus Christ and take the battle right to the enemy's gates then we'll have to endure. <laughs> now, the battle for truth is not always easy. In this battle, there are times you may be sorely wounded, times when you may feel down, maybe times when you wonder hardly what way to turn in the battle. But why do you make the wounded in the battle? Praise God, you'll never be defeated because the battle is the Lord. Now, when you look out in this big world tonight, think of all that's going on all around us. You know, what's happening in Northern Ireland is like the Boston Tea Party compared with other parts of the world. You think of the sin that goes on in our wee province. God knows it's terrible. It, 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 it's a terrible thing when men profess to be Christians and yet have done the things they have done. And you would almost be driven to the conclusion that at this moment, Satan and sin has got the victory. For the soldiers of the Lord, we have got the fight on. Praise God, the day will come when Psalm 2 will be fulfilled. Then Jesus Christ shall take his seat upon the holy hell of Zion, and the heathen shall become his footstool. 
and there shall be in derision. And in that day, we as soldiers of Christ, as warriors in the battle, we'll share in his victory. Paul says to us tonight, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Now that's the privilege the soldier of Christ enjoys. Is chosen by the Lord to be a soldier. What's the position he must maintain? Verse 4. No man that warreth entangles himself with the affairs of this life. Now, that word entangleth only appears twice in the New Testament. It appears in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 20, and it appears here in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. But to get the meaning of the word, you must go back to the book of Exodus chapter 14 and verse 3. It says this, For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, They are entangled in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. And the idea of the word entangled is held prisoner. And the word affairs means the matters of this life. And the only thing that a soldier of Christ has got to do is to be taken up with the affairs of him who has called you to be a soldier. And we as soldier warriors of the King of Kings must be separated. We must not be held prisoners by the affairs of this life. What does it mean? Does it mean that a businessman must give up his business? No, no. It simply means this, that the businessman hasn't allowed the business to rule him. He's to rule that. He's not to be a prisoner. You know, there are some women who are prisoners to their home. It's all to think about. Well, the woman yonder in Newcastle, when you went into the home to sit down, she put a sheet of paper below you before you sat on the seat. I went in one day, the place was absolutely shining. You never saw anything like it. And you know what women are when you go in, they're all the same. Here's the first thing, oh, Mr. Irvin, look at this place. And I start looking at it. I would shut up, I never would see it. And I went in, she says, oh, Mr. Irvin, look at this place. I says, it's terrible here. It was shining. She didn't know what to say. She wanted me to sit with her. I was going by one day, and she says, Mr. Irvin, there's weeds in this old lawn. She says, Mrs. Weeds have been scared to come up in your lawn. <laughs> you see, you're a prisoner to your home. What do you think about it? You get in. Some people are a prisoner to their complex. Some men are a prisoner to their car. All the top of those their car. And then he manages to get to the gown. And it says to me, if anybody's to get the gun, I don't know what's in the book and tell you. I just let her go to stocks. <laughs> and I was like, what to tell you about anybody to get the gun? And that's what the Lord said. Here's a position as a soldier. You've got to maintain it. You're not to become a prisoner. For the affairs of this life. I've got to take it up And here's a purpose he must pursue. It says that. To please him who is called him. That's the purpose. That's the God. Please have said of the Lord Jesus Christ, he pleased God himself. That's the reason why God could open the windows of heaven and say, This is my beloved son and whom I am well pleased. You know the cause of Samson's downfall? He pleased himself. He says to his prayers, There's a woman down there, an ungodly woman. This is better for me, for she pleases me now. And that's what we're not to do. But I'll tell you this, friend. If you please the Lord, you'll not please other people. You can rest content for that. I know there's churches wouldn't ask me to preach at. So, because I know I don't please them. But I don't worry tuppence about them. Because I want to please him. I'll make their ticket collector at the station. And you've got the new woman who uses the commandments. The Bible and say, morning, John. You say, good morning, sir. Good morning. This morning, the station master whose office was up above said down word and said, everybody has got to show their ticket. And these boys come up in a hurry and said, morning, John. Ticket, sir. Ah, John's ticket, sir. He starts looking for the ticket. And one says, John, 
We love the very popular this morning. This is that incredible and popular that you're not. That was unpopular for that way of there. This is not. This mother will get popular down here and not as long as they're popular up there for the Lord. And here's the thing, here's the purpose that you got to pursue as a soldier of Jesus Christ. You've got to please have. What good thing if we hear the top of clock. We're going to put a calendar on. And what I want to do now is this. I want to show you three, three men who stood out as soldier warriors. For the Lord. And I want you to see the things that made them the kind of men they were. When you go to the book of Joshua, chapter 1, you get Joshua there. And the outstanding thing about Joshua was his fitness. He was fit to be the leader of the people of God. He was a fit man to fight the battles of the Lord. Because he was fit, he was able to conquer for God. Old Moses, the Lord of earth, the God kept him to hear his dad. He was buried yonder by God in an ordinary tree. His mighty fell in Joshua. And Joshua had to take the children of Israel over the Jordan and into the land and to conquer the land. What a time. And it says this in verse 2 of Joshua 1 Moses is dead. Now therefore arise. Go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give them. That was the task that was given. Take them over into the land that I have given them. And before he goes over into the land, in verse 9, God gives him this promise. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage, be not afraid, neither be dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. And he took the promise of God, and he believed what God said, that God was going to be with him in the battles and conquering the land. And because he took the promise of God, he was fit to be a soldier of the Lord. Friend, there's a task given to us, and it's a great task. It's a tremendous task. Who went to all the world and preached the gospel to every preacher. We have got to go forth into a world and tell them this message that 2,000 years ago, a man went to a cross and died to give the penalty for sin, and if you believe in him, you should. No wonder it says that the preaching of the cross was a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. Imagine telling a man that 2,000 years ago a man died on a cross and through his death he can be forgiven and taken to heaven. And the coming day. My task, isn't it? But that's the task he's given. But here's the great thing. In this task that has been given us of preaching the gospel, Christ says, I'm with you. And I'll make you strong. And I'll fit you for the job. And you can carry the battle to them. And it was that which it was taking the divine promise, as it were, putting his feet on it, that made him more than a conqueror. When you go to Joshua chapter 14, you have a man there called Caleb. And the outstanding thing about Caleb that made him a soldier warrior for the Lord was his faithfulness. His faith. Moses said this in verse 9, or says this in verse 9. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land wherein thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance and thy children forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord. The holy you see, he was one of the two spies who came back to the good report. You remember Israel had come to Kadesh Barnea, right on the borders of the promised land, and God says, Go in. He said, No, we'll send them twelve spies by the land. And they come back again and said, Give back to the bad report. And they said, We're not able to take the land, the giants there. And they said, We're the grasshoppers in their sight. Who had people exaggerated? 
Joshua come back and he says, or Caleb come back, he says, we're well able to take it. What happened? The ten saw God through the giants. He says, we can't do it. And Joshua, Joshua, or Caleb, saw the giants through God. He says, we're well able. He was faithful. He was faithful. And God always rewards faithful. And when he's done, he'll say, well, God did it. The thing that fitted this man was this. He believed God. He believed God could do it. And that God on his side. The last man is in 1 Samuel 17, 32. It's David. And that Joshua was marked by fitness. And Caleb was marked by faithfulness. David was marked by fearlessness. We see the Philistines that gathered together the war against Israel. And then the army of the Philistines, there was Goliath, the giant. And when the men of Israel saw him, it says this in verse 24, all the men of Israel, when they saw that mob, fled from him and were sore afraid. But David says this in thir verse 32, let no man's heart fail him because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. He goes, he put on the arm. He didn't put it on the arm. He said, no, it's no good. But yes, don't do that. And he goes out. And he goes out, he meets the giant, and he says this, Thou comest to me with a sword and a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts. And David walked out in the name of the Lord of hosts. And he wasn't afraid. And he took five stones and a wee slime. He put a stone in the slime. Get it to be buried. Get it to be He just had the giant there. The giant said, Such a thing never went to the man at the foot. And he dropped it. He went to the other. Now, those are the things that should mark the Lord Airs for the Lord. We have his promise. We believe him is marked by it. God granted you the soldier warriors for the war, that we will carry the back of the to the very gates of hell and sing and say. Then there's no use having meetings and singing our hymns and saying our prayers if we're going to let that big world out there stay to on the head and not try to reach them with the gospel of the grace of God. And Paul said, I could wish myself accursed, I could wish myself God first, for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. May God give us a passion with that for the souls of men. May God make us warriors in this battle, that we will not only contend for the faith and stand for it, no matter what comes or goes, or the like old James Craig so long ago, not a man not given up. We'll carry the faith to those who are without Christ and tell them of the Savior who not them. And I thank you, man. <laughs> when all my labors and trials are o'er, and I am safe on that beautiful shore, just to be near the dear Lord I adore, well through the ages, will be glory for me. Nine, four, nine. <laughs>
Thank you for your word tonight. Bless it to her heart. Heart is with your blessing. Keep your hand upon us. The people of God said, Amen. and they all shared it. Here's the Lord. Amen. Thank you for watching this video. Feel free to like this video and subscribe to this channel to stay up to date with new videos as they come online.